I'm Mary McCluskey. I, um, the, I just want to say that the welcome, the access team welcomes everyone here for this talk on ALS disability. And um, our hope is um, the access team is to help not just bring awareness to uh, disabilities and the difficulties that people face, but um, to remind us that we are all in solidarity with all people and um, just help us to um, continue to be um, people that look out for others and I empathize and help each other. So um, I look forward to this talk and I'll turn it over to Amy. Hi, I've had the pleasure of communicating with these two women from ALS of Michigan to um, arrange this talk. Um, in case you haven't heard of their organization, here's a little something I'll tell you about it. It's a voluntary not-for-profit organization that helps people with ALS, their caregivers, and their families live life as fully as possible. And today we're going to have Linda Kern speak with us. Linda is a licensed medical social worker and a patient service coordinator. So she helps with um, support and information, and they have a loan closet <coughs> with equipment, and she participates in local events, lucky for us, even Zoom events. Mm -hmm. And um, she represents the ALS of Michigan at Henry Ford's ALS Clinic. Um, she graduated from Wayne State with a bachelor's and a master's in social work. She has 18 years of experience, so lots of uh, experience to draw from. Actually, and just, 26 now. <laughs> oh, it is. It, that was an old bio that I read. Yes, that was when I first started in 2012. Ah, okay. Um, and judging from our experience today, I can also add that she is very patient and flexible, which I'm sure comes in handy for her work. So let's welcome Linda and her colleague Judy. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Yes, I do want to make sure that I do a shout out to Judy because uh, you know she she has taught me a lot of like most all that I know about working there. Uh, she's been a great mentor, and uh, I won't get choked up, but uh, uh, I, I'm going to mention that she's she's going to be she's retiring uh, after is it 20 or 21 years. Judy. Oh, no, it's uh, more than 18. Okay, yes. sorry. Uh, but still, that, that is quite, um, quite a long time for you to provide your expertise, your compassion, and your knowledge uh, and help the people that, that we work with. So uh, I do want to acknowledge you for that because I'm glad that you're here to, uh, to join me today as well. Had me right there, Linda, almost on the verge of tears, but it's okay. Sorry. It's, I, I know it's a bittersweet moment to retire because I have worked with, as I said earlier, so many wonderful families and I, I will miss them, but I'm going to continue to do the Northville support group to stay connected. So, yep. Thank you for your kind words. Of course. It's easy. <laughs> um. So, you know, just as a recap, I have been working for ALS of Michigan for eight years now. And um, I, I have a, a PowerPoint that I shared with, uh, with Debbie. And uh, Amy was kind enough to send me um, a list of some things that she thought people would want to know about ALS. Um, in my Zoom presentation, um, in my PowerPoint, is more of kind of the statistical information. Um, I can get into so, some of the other um, kind of more personal questions and then I would invite by all means Lisa to help answer some of the more personalized questions because you know although I don't uh, live with ALS every day uh, I, I can speak from experience and working with many many families but I can't speak uh, for Lisa and and you know so I would want her to chime in if she feels that she would like to add anything Debbie do you have the the presentation I do have the PowerPoint Linda so hang on a second okay and let me put it in slideshow mode okay and you'll have to cue me when you want me to change it 
Okay. So we can go ahead and move to the first slide. So just as a, you know, a basic um, opener about ALS, ALS is, stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, which is a rare progressive neurological disease that's caused by the gradual degeneration of motor neurons. Um, so kind of in simple terms, these motor neurons carry messages from the brain to the muscles. Uh, and as those motor neurons die, those messages are no longer received by the muscles and the muscles then weaken and atrophy. Hang on a second. So um, I'll, I'll probably be re repeating, oh, be, um, repeating some of this back and forth. If you want to pack back up one. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, you know, for every person who um, is diagnosed with ALS, their ALS starts differently. It, there is no um, one way for people to, um, to start uh, ALS symptoms. Um, early symptoms usually include muscle weakness or stiffness, and those, that muscle weakness can be in different areas of the body. Um, so, and I'll be repeating this in another slide as well, but, um, uh, people will have either bulbar, bulbar symptoms or limb onset. And with bulbar symptoms, their ability to speak and eat, uh, you know, to the, they may have some slurred speech or they may have, um, difficulty swallowing and having some choking episodes. And um, then with, uh, limb onset, there could be some weakness in their hands or their arms. Uh, there could be a drop foot where their toe uh, catches and they trip. And those are sometimes some of the early symptoms that occur um, that have people saying, boy, I need to check things out. This isn't my normal way that I am accustomed to moving or speaking or eating, etc. Okay, are you ready? Sure. This is a picture of one of our PALS. PALS stands for people or person with ALS. So you I may refer to PALS. Kensington Walk, I believe. So all of our services are funded through donation and fundraising events. And this is a picture from one of our walks, which is our major fundraiser. Okay. Uh, statistically, slightly more men than uh, women are diagnosed with ALS. Um, you know, ALS affects all ages and ethnic backgrounds. Um, and although it, it affects all ages and ethnic backgrounds, it's most common in Caucasians and Hispanics, ages 55 to 75. Um, we have had people in their 20s that we have worked with and people in their 90s that we've worked with. Um, so certainly there's, uh, you know, there's quite a span but the average age is uh, somewhere between 55 and 75. And um, veterans are considered at higher risk, uh, possibly related to the increased exposure to environmental toxins. Um, the VA had, uh, I can't remember what year it was off the top of my head, but um, had considered ALS. Um, what, what's the, uh, is it presumed? What is it? Judy, presumptive, presumptive. Yeah, eligibility. Yeah, so uh, someone diagnosed with ALS then uh, has access to um, a wealth of benefits through VA. I guess one of the things I didn't think of uh, mentioning is, you know, we can do uh, questions as we go along, or we can do questions at the end. I don't know what everybody else is comfortable with. Like I said before, each person's course of the disease is different. We talked about limb onset and we talked about uh, bulbar onset. Lisa, how much do you, do you want to involve yourself in the discussion. Do you want to share anything about your early symptoms or how you uh, 
uh, you know, came to be diagnosed? Sure. I was having, um, people kept telling me I was limping. And it wasn't until we moved to Ann Arbor that I realized I really could not walk around town. And that was in 2018. And then I started the very long process of going from doctor to doctor and physical therapy trying to figure out what was wrong and then my breathing was affected and that's when it really hit home and someone else noticed my breathing and I didn't even notice it so let's I, talk oh I'm sorry Lisa I'll let you finish and then I have something to add I was um I'm told I had multifocal motor neuropathy. And I was treated for that. I mean, they have to rule everything out and there's no tests for ALS. And then I finally got diagnosed and it's just gone downhill from there. So Lisa's um journey sounds pretty familiar to me and it's it's very frustrating i think for a lot of people because they have these symptoms and they go to the doctor and many times they say oh you need back surgery or you have a pinched nerve or something mm -hmm. they have the surgery and they don't get any better so you know there is no one test that tells you it's als it's really um excluding other diseases with the same symptoms. So sometimes it can take over two years to get a diagnosis. And, I, you know, very frustrating for families because they're dealing with all of these changes and nobody can tell them what's wrong. It took 10 months. Yeah. That does sound familiar. Mm -hmm. 10 months from the time I finally decided that something was wrong and I better figure it out. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that with us, Lisa. So yeah, just to piggyback about the um, diagnosis of exclusion, that's one of the reasons why it takes so long is all of the testing and, um, you know, trying to confirm the diagnosis. A lot of people choose to get a second confirmation of the diagnosis. Um, the EMG is generally what confirms uh, ALS. It's a test where there's uh, all these little needles um, that uh, test the motor, uh, the, the damage to the motor neurons. Lisa, are you seen at uh, U, U of M? Is that right? Yes, at the ALS clinic there. Um, okay. We were just ready to call in a hospice, Angela Hospice, um, right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But then at that point, we didn't want anybody in the house, so we never returned their call. But That's yeah. okay. When you're ready, you can call them again. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as you probably know, and, and from my experience being at the Henry Ford ALS clinic, um, they check on, they, they do something called an FRS or functional rating scale uh, each time that you go in for a clinic visit and it compares your level of functioning uh, of a variety of tasks with your last visit. And uh, at, their, at the, your first visit, they do one as well so that they have something to go by as they go along. So as um, symptoms uh, worsen, if you know, weakness, whether it be uh, like, for instance, when Lisa talks about having breathing issues and now she has got the, uh, <laughs> uh, like a, a sip, sip and puff style, um, is it a, uh, like a non-invasive ventilator, correct? Okay. I, um, I wear a, a regular mask where it pushes the air in my lungs. Okay. At night you wear that? I was just, mm -hmm. I didn't know if you said you wore it at night. And I wear a, the mask where 
the air is pushed into my lungs. But yeah, this I just sip on throughout the day constantly. So one of the things that happens with, with um, a decline in respiratory function is the muscles that move the diaphragm and allow you to take a nice deep breath and exhale uh, the breath uh, become very weakened and they need uh, um, what we call bi-level or BiPAP machine that helps both <laughs> with uh, pushing air into the lungs and then helping to pull the air out of the lungs. Um, a lot of people have heard of CPAP machines and that's just one function which helps push the air into the lungs because people usually don't initiate the breath, but this does both functions. So I think um, what people might not know is that ALS only affects um, voluntary muscles and the diaphragm is a voluntary muscle. So, you know, all other muscles like the heart, it isn't a voluntary muscle, so it's not affected, but the respiratory system is because of course, the diaphragm is a voluntary muscle and the ancillary muscles around the lungs are voluntary as well. That's why respiratory is affected in the way it is. This is another one of our pals and his son. This is at the Stony Creek Walk. So just talking a little bit more about our, our services, Amy had noted that, um, that we have a loan closet, uh, which is full of all kinds of durable medical equipment that's typically not covered by insurance that helps people with eating, grooming, dressing, bathing, mobility. Um, it, it's a very long list of kinds of things that we, that we carry. Um, it, 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 the list is probably too, too long to just name everything. Normally when we talk with people, we find out what kind of challenges they're having so that we can recommend certain pieces that might be able to assist them and make things easier because who doesn't want to make things easier? Uh, we do a lot of information re referral and resource. Um, res our respite care assistance program, which Judy has been heading up for uh, all these years, and uh, this, we pay for 12 hours a month at up to $18 an hour for people to hire help at home through a home care agency. Do you want to add to that, Judy? Um, no, I, you, you know, if anybody's interested, they call us. At one point, we had an extensive waiting list, but due to um, a grant we get through the Team Gleason Foundation, we no longer have a waiting list, so it's available to anybody with an ALS or PLS diagnosis. PLS being primary lateral sclerosis, which is um, a slow progressing form that generally turns into ALS at some point. So, you know, um, when we started the program, uh, we had, I think, two people on it, and it, now we have up to 100 on any any given day. So it's uh, beneficial to people who feel they have the need um, to have additional support in the home, really designed to give the primary caregiver a break because they can do a variety of things. It's not just hands-on care. They can do light housekeeping, meal prep, laundry. They can run errands. They can also help with like personal care and, and you know sitting with the patient, but that doesn't necessarily have to be what they do. That's it. <laughs> uh, no, I like that you add more. You always have something else good to add to it. Um, our augmentative and alternative communication uh, options at our office are shared with, um, are shared by Lisa Bardak, who's our resident speech and language pathologist. And she's known around the country for what she does with alternative communication, both low tech to high tech. Uh, she does a lot of work with eye gaze. Uh, so people can, who have lost their natural speech can continue to communicate by using their eyes to type. And, um, and then it can uh, be activated to speak out loud for them. And there's also message banking uh, and voice banking for people who want to record their own voice and uh, messages to be able to then play later 
Um, so instead of like a computer voice, it would be their voice. And she is also, she's also able to help people continue to be connected via internet and, and computer, if, even when they can no longer use their hands to type. And um, I've been volunteering at Angela Hospice mm -hmm. in the Care Center for as long as I've been at ALS of Michigan. And we've had uh, many ALS patients there who, even though they can no longer use their hands or their voice, are able to communicate with pieces of equipment that Lisa can work with um, our pals to get. And you know, while it, it'll never replace your natural speech, it does allow you to communicate and some people are really good at it and very quick. So we always encourage people if they're starting to have those difficulties or difficulties accessing you know, their computer to contact Lisa because she, she's good at what she does and she'll help you out. For sure. And she's also uh, knowledgeable about um, like smart home technology and things like that too. And she can help out with, um, um, you know, I, I don't want to say her name because I have one on my desk right now. Uh, <laughs> but it sounds like Alexa. And uh, <laughs> anyway, but there's a lot that, that, uh, that she can do as well with smart plugs and turning on lights as you enter a room rather than having to find a switch or, you know, turning on a TV or a radio, opening doors. There's all kinds of things depending on uh, uh, what your resources are. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that, uh, um, that I did an accessible home workshop last week. And uh, so we do a, a number of workshops and seminars to help educate uh, our pals and their families about things that they want to, they may want to take into consideration uh, on this journey. Uh, we do support groups. I know that Judy mentioned that she facilitates the Northville support group and I facilitate the Sterling Heights support group. Um, one of the other things I think that we do very well through our office, if I don't say so myself, is our one-to-one -one emotional support. Um, you know, we're not just about, you know, giving people wheelchairs or um, just giving them resources. Uh, you know, we take our support of our families very seriously, and um, we know this is a very challenging journey, uh, and whatever we can do to be there and supportive is uh you know that's it, why we exist that's why we're here okay so we have been this is our 42nd year this year and uh this just happens i know that uh we were asked about the our address so this is our address uh our website i encourage you if you're interested in some more information uh to check out our website and keep in mind that we are a nonprofit organization, so we can't provide all everything that everyone needs. We do the best we can, but we know, we have other resources for additional support. Um, mm -hmm. When people call, we refer them to other organizations that may be able to help them if we are unable to. But I think we do a pretty good job on our big part-time staff of seven people. <laughs> Is this the end of the slideshow, Linda? No, I think there's a couple more. Oh, a couple more, okay. <laughs> I can't see like what number we're on, but um, but as Judy had mentioned, you know, being a non-for-profit, we do not receive funding from uh, federal or state kinds of grants. Everything that we do is, is fundraising. Uh, and we don't charge anyone for our services or the equipment that we loan. Uh, everything is free of charge. All of our dollars that we raise stay here, right here in Michigan. Uh, we don't have a, a, a bigger uh, corporation that we funnel money to or anything. I mean, we're just a small organization, like Judy said, of seven part-time uh, staffers. Um, so just to let you know some of the things that we do to, to raise money, uh, we do have our auction mania that starts tomorrow where we have well over 100 items up for a bid uh, for our online auction. There's, uh, there's jewelry, there's clothing, there's uh, trips, there's uh, gift, cards. 
gift cards. Yeah, uh, it's there's a lot going on. I was just perusing it uh, day before yesterday, getting getting ready to make my bids. Uh, <laughs> um, we also, our biggest fundraisers are our walk and roll for ALS. And we have four walks that we do in the fall. Uh, as you see, we have our Midland Walk up at Emerson Park. That's on September 20th. Our Lansing Walk at Hawk Island Park on September 27th. And then our biggest walks, which is, uh, uh, they're held on the same day as our Kensington Walk and our Stony Creek Walk on Sunday, October 4th. And then prior to the Kensington <laughs> Walk is a, the, a 5K run. So those are ways I know that uh, Amy and I uh, chatted briefly via email um, she was asking how people might be able to support the organization, uh, thus supporting, you know, an organization that, that, that's helping, uh, you know, uh, people in their community as well, including Lisa. Uh, I had suggested, you know, if there was someone who wanted to take on being a team captain and starting a walk, a walk team, that's an, an option. And, uh, you know, with our challenging times that we're facing right now, uh, we don't know what those walks are going to look like this year, but we're preparing <coughs> to have people um, get on board with being a virtual walker as well. Some of the other community resources is the ALS Association. Uh, over on the west side of Michigan, the Susan Mast Foundation has done a lot for PALS. Um, the resource for uh, the information that I gathered for our presentation today was through the National Institute on Health. And then one of the things that I added to this was uh, for additional consideration, uh, if anybody was interested in taking a look at it. And in fact, I, I think I talked to Debbie about playing a short video. That's one of the links that's here. Um, it's uh, Dr. Welsh that uh, who had ALS and it's part of a larger video that um, discusses end of life decisions. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a very telling video about how he perceived his, um, you know, the, the, the losses that he experienced with ALS as far as uh, losing uh, different functions. And then he also did an essay which he uh, submitted to the LA Times, which is included in this other link as well, if anyone wants to read it. Uh, he's a smart guy. I do have the film, uh, Linda. Do you want me to do that right now? Yeah, I think that would be good. Judy, unless there's something else that you think we needed to add to that part? No, nope, and after that, uh, we can take any questions that anyone might have. Okay, sure. I think on. there was a couple other slides too that I wanted to make sure that I touch oh. base on. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, Linda. No, no, don't be sorry. I just I looked down at my notes and I thought, oh, I, I do want to touch base on these. Um, so uh, one of the things that Amy had asked because she wanted to know how your church community can be supportive, and a couple of um, good ways is through Share the Care and Meal Train. Uh, Share the Care it has both a website and a book, and um, essentially they provide the foundation for organizing a group of friends or family or both to share caregiving duty. Uh, they call themselves a care group. Um, but on the website is a faith communities tab that I thought you might be interested in as well. And that uh, illustrates how a faith community can also be part of that and arrange that as well. And then the meal train uh, is designed to create a calendar for giving and receiving meals. Uh, so to help family, and, th and that could be in, in all kinds of situations, uh, but it allows the people to, you know, allows people to sign up for certain days, certain foods. Uh, I, th I think I was reading something when I was, uh, when I was on the website about uh, it, it avoids having like 14 lasagnas. Uh, things like that, or, you know, if someone has dietary restrictions, not, not being, having to face uh, uh, wasting food and whatnot, uh, but it's another good way to be helpful. So and I wanted to make sure I, I added that. And share the care as well. Their website has all kinds of helpful, like, um, 
information on how to set up a phone tree and make a calendar. It's, it's an excellent resource as well if you're going to set up a team of um, people to help out. Okay, agreed. Uh, trying to look to see what other um, slides I had. I couldn't remember if I had another one past that. I think that's all I've got, Linda. Okay. So here is the film. I often think about what I call the 100 things. Here's how it works. Imagine a list of 100 things you do most days. Some are routine, some are chores, some are pleasurable. Get out of bed and walk to the bathroom. Kiss your wife. Answer the phone. And drive your car to work. Go play golf with your friends. Brush your teeth. Write a letter, lick and seal the envelope closed and put a stamp on it. Hug your child. Of course, we do many more than 100 things each day, but for now, just imagine 100 that are essential to the life you live. Now, if you take away one, you can still do 99. Is life worth living without being able to smell the rose in the garden? Of course it is. How about losing two or seven or 23? Is life still worth living? Of course. But suppose you get to where you've lost, say, 90 things. And now with each thing taken away, a bad thing is added. You can no longer walk well, and you start falling, and it hurts. Your grip is gone, and you also suffer the ignominy of wetting your pants because of bladder spasms. You can't turn over in bed, and that also means you will get bed sores unless someone turns you frequently. Life is still worth living but you're getting tired. Okay. I like this. I like this video because of the the illustration that it gives of losing um, losing the ability to do even just simple things that we normally take for granted that we don't think about as being um, I, we just do them without thinking and I think that uh, it, it was a very good illustration of you know yeah people have a lot of choices to make and attitude is everything with ALS. I've, I've met a lot of families and I have people who have just phenomenal attitudes and say, this is not going to hold me back. I'm going to continue to do everything I can for as long as I can. And I have had some people who uh, tend to have a, a very give up attitude very early on before they've really lost um, those 90 things that they can't do anymore. Uh, I know that, like I mentioned, this video is part of a larger picture regarding end-of-life care, and there's a lot of decisions that uh, that pals need to make as far as I know that uh, Lisa mentioned hospice and things like that, and uh, what what is valuable about those kinds of uh, additional supports and, and uh, care options and things like that. 
uh, to have in the home. And I think what, what it is good at doing is um, letting people know that, you know, now is the time to make plans. Don't wait till there's an emergency situation because you don't want to be making tr difficult choices under emergency situations in an ER um, where if you have it planned out, it will make things a lot easier. For everyone. Yes. Yes. Thank you for adding that, Judy, because you're absolutely correct. Are there any questions for us? I, I have one. Is there research ongoing? I'm sure there must be on uh, how to treat or um, solve any of these problems about ALS. It's always going. Uh, there's always research going on. There's always uh, clinical trials and studies and things like that going on too, trying to uh, find something to slow the progression of the disease. Uh, right now, there's only two uh, treatments, if you will, um, that are available to PALS. There's uh, Rylazol, or it's also called Rylatec, and there's uh, Radicava. Uh, Rylazol is a pill, and Radicava is an infusion through like an IV. Um, both both designed in some in, in very similar ways to slow the progression. It's kind of up in the air of how effective they are. And you know, in all of my time at ALS of Michigan, um, all of us have been to the International Motor Neuron Disease Symposium that's held once a year, every other year here in the U.S. and and then every other year at another country. And I can tell you that there are many, many doctors who are working to try and find a treatment or a cure for this disease. Most of the, a lot of them, that since my 18 years, have spent their whole life trying to figure this out and, you know, didn't live to see the end result. But there is ongoing research all over the place by many neurologists and researchers to try and work this out. And, you know, I think Linda had mentioned earlier about um, the higher incidence here in Michigan than a lot of other states for our, you know, per capita than a lot of other states. And um, my husband pointed out to me just day before yesterday that he had gotten an update because he he's a U of M alum and there was an update from Eva Feldman that, you know, in fact, and this has been, they've thought this for a while, that with the sporadic type of ALS, which is the, you know, it doesn't play favorites, it's an equal opportunity disease, that, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in our environment that is not um, conducive to healthy bodies and lifestyles. And uh, she thinks there is a, a definite connection between environmental toxins and ALS that, you know, of course, is different with familial, which is genetic, but most of this, most of the people who are diagnosed are sporadic. So uh, a lot of stuff in our atmosphere and our environment that is good for us. And you know, she's trying to figure out the connection and she feels there is one. Yes, we. Uh, I don't know if um, I don't know if it's on our website, but Dr. Goutman from U of M did a, a, a research update with us last summer, and he goes into great detail about some of the theories behind the environmental toxins and where they are concentrated in Michigan, uh, where where you're seeing a, a, a greater incidence of people with uh, that are being diagnosed with ALS. Uh, who tend to be in these certain areas and how those exposures uh, can happen very early on in age and, and be repetitive depending on if you're, you know, if you live in a certain area that has the higher toxin levels and things like that and having repeated exposure to. Did that help answer your question? Janet? Is Lisa on any treatments, Nick? 
Go. I have not because um, the in the uh, um, blood infusion or what are you calling it? The radicopa really um, was not encouraged by that treatment. He felt that he's seen a lot of his patients go downhill quicker with the treatment. Oh. And the pill, um, I had, uh, what was it? Too many, something in my liver was too high. So I am not able to do any of the treatments. Well, and you have to keep in mind, too, that these treatments are not without side effects. So you're right, Lisa. It's, it's about weighing the pros and cons. And with them not being really able to say anything that, other than it might prolong, you know, life for a few months, you really do have to take those into consideration. Because we've had people, as Linda can attest to, that have taken Williuzol, which has been around for more than 20 years, who, who couldn't take it because it affected them adversely, as well as the radicava. So, yeah, there, those are all choices everyone has to make, and you have to make the one that's best for you. I do have a feeding tube, and they they offered me a trach so I could breathe better, but I said no to that. Yes, they're all personal choices, absolutely. I'm glad you've discussed those and made decisions about them. Lisa, I think we all want to know how best we can support you as a church and um, individually. Um, honestly, other than praying and praying for my family, I don't really know when there was church, people were coming over and staying with me while Nick had to go to church on Sunday morning. Um, the, the one good thing about the pandemic is somebody's <laughs> always home with me now. <laughs> yes. So that's a blessing in disguise. Um, my daughter and her family are moving in with us tomorrow. Oh wow! All so right. I'll have we'll have some additional help with my other daughter going away to college and. And my son ready to get his own apartment. Um, I don't know how the church can help. I, I, I don't know. So many transitions happening. Yeah. yeah. You know, my suggestion would be, um, Lisa, for you and your family to, as things come up that you think you might be able to use assistance with, to write them down. Um, what I found with my time here at ALS is that, um, you know, a lot of people do want to provide assistance, but they don't know what you want. And if you write them down, rather than waiting until somebody says, well, how can I help? It's hard to remember what might be helpful. Plus, it, it, that way they have an opportunity, opportunity to pick out what they would like to help with that they're comfortable doing. Because if you ask somebody to do something that they're not comfortable with, they'll do it once and that'll be it. But if they pick out something that, you know, they are comfortable doing, they will probably continue to help in that way for as long as needed. So just a suggestion. I did have um, Olivia coming over and helping me write letters to my family mm -hmm. and so I have a little journal started but then the pandemic came and like I said we didn't want anybody in the house right so but that's a great well, just know that we all care very much about you thank you so much you are in our prayers thank you don't make me cry yes. I can't breathe when I cry <laughs> Well, perhaps you can still do the letter writing via Zoom. Oh, maybe. That's a good idea. Oh. Yeah. That way you don't have to forego it. You'll still be able to, you know, have that face-to-face -face interaction, so to speak, and, uh, and be able to get your, uh, you know, your thoughts done on paper. That's a good idea. 
or FaceTime. It doesn't have to be Zoom. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. If Olivia was taking dictation from you, she I have seen her on Zoom, so it's an option. Okay. If you'd like to pursue it. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions that we can help answer? Can I ask about your loan equipment? Sure. Um, I sometimes have people who are downsizing or are they done with a piece of equipment? Is your closet specialized for ALS or is it anything like shower chairs or walkers or I just wonder as as what to tell people when they have something to donate. Are you open to accepting donations? We do. Um, we oftentimes have, you know, other families who've already used the equipment want to donate it afterwards. We also get people who, um, who have not been dealing with ALS and want to donate equipment. Um, we have to be somewhat choosy about some of the pieces that we take because we have a limited space and uh, for hygienic reasons and things like that, there are some certain things that we cannot take. Um, you know, there are certain, because of, there are some, some pieces of equipment that do tend to be more helpful for people with ALS, for instance, standard walkers, like the sort of the, I call it the old fashioned kind, the little silver one with maybe the tennis balls on the end, aren't as helpful as seeing a seated walker. Um, you know, the one with the, with the seat and the hand brakes and things like that. So, I mean, we, we do kind of on a case by case basis will, you know, um, assess whether or not the equipment that someone wants to donate is appropriate. Um, one of the things that we kind of, um, the, the only kind of snag that we often seem to hit is that people want us to be able to pick it up and we don't have like a van to, to come by and pick things up. So people do need to bring them to our office. Uh, so sometimes that ends up being, like I said, a snag in, able, in being able to get certain items to our office. But that being said, when I started at ALS of Michigan, mm -hmm. we had one manual wheelchair in our loan closet. We now have <laughs> more power chairs than I can count and a, a huge space. And without people donating families who had ALS or PLS, we wouldn't even have a loan closet. But like Linda said, we do have to be a bit selective. We do have limited space. People many times want to donate hospital beds. We don't have room for those. Um, and, you know, like Linda said, things uh, like um, bedside commodes, because we don't have any way of sterilizing them or sanitizing them, we don't take them. But without donations, we wouldn't have a loan closet. So the best recommendation I would have is if somebody has something to donate, if they write up a list of what they have, give us a call and we tell you what we can and can't take. We also have a list that we maintain of, um, sometimes people have stair lifts and like Judy said, hospital beds and things that we cannot store in our loan closet, but that people need nonetheless. And um, we have a list of, of available items for people. And then we also have a list of people who who need certain items. So when an item comes in or we become aware of, the, of its availability through another family, we can make that connection for, you know, with them and help them uh, get what they're looking for, hopefully. And people even send us information about accessible vans that they no longer need because um, a handicapped accessible van is a very expensive thing. And we're fortunate that our, our families, once they no longer need it, would prefer to give us the information rather than sell it back to a dealer who's going to raise the price on it. So many times you can get a pretty nice van for less than you would if you went and bought a used van from a dealer. So, you know, we keep a list of those as well. And a lot of the small items in our loan closet that are not power wheelchairs, not Hoyers, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, there are things like uh, built up silverware, scoop plates, uh, dressing tools, things like that, that we actually purchase 
and send directly to PALS. Um, some, some of the items we, you know, get returned to us, so we do have them available in the office, but especially right now with the pandemic and um, we all are working from home right now, even though uh, we may pop into the office from time to time to get something done because it's easier to do it there. Um, uh, we, we're doing a lot more drop shipping to people of all kinds of equipment, even you know transport wheelchairs and manual wheelchairs right now, uh, mostly because it's you know it just doesn't make sense to keep making trips to the office to have people come and pick those items up, those smaller items. Amy, were there other questions on that list we had initially? Some of the some of the questions that that you had that I that I did not go over because I know a lot of it um, is very personalized and and if Lisa wants to, you know, uh, you know, to chime in and and give some of her own uh, personal experience with some of these, uh, I think you know you talked about um, you know you asked what the hardest part about having ALS is and, um, you know, a, a satisfying simple pleasure for someone with ALS, which of course, I think for both of those varies uh, person to person. Um, obviously I think, you know, but it made me start thinking about quality of life and uh, how important quality of life is uh, for everyone and what we all consider to make our lives quality or a moment or a thing uh, or an experience uh, is different, you know, whether it be uh, someone holding your hand or someone bringing you your favorite food or watching your favorite movie with the person that you love or, you know, getting a hug from someone that you love or hearing from someone that you love or just comfort. And I don't know about you, Lisa, but um, I hear a lot of people with ALS talk about how uncomfortable they are and how hard it is to get comfortable. And um, as your muscles weaken, it's difficult to, to even just adjust yourself. You know, we do it all the time. We, you know, yeah. change position in our chair or we move or we scratch our, our head or, you know, kind of tickle our nose, things like that, which is virtually impossible for a lot of people with ALS and have to ask uh, to have those things done for them. Um, so, I mean, even just those things can be comforting to not have to have um, pain or um, pressure on their backside and things like that. So we talk about equipment that can help uh, with that part of quality of life. And we also have, I, I personally, I think when first diagnosed or even throughout the disease process, a lot of people are concerned because none of us know and they don't know what's going to happen next or when. What, what are they going to lose the ability to do next? And for a lot of people, as for all of us, the unknown is scary and, and difficult to deal with when you don't know what the, what's coming next. So I hear a lot of that from our families, not just our pals, but our families as well, because you can't you can't prepare for something if you don't know what that something is. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you, Judy. That unpredictability is a very difficult part of the ALS. Can, uh, can I say that I'm curious about the um, walking effort as a fundraiser? Um, and I, the one that looks closest to us is the Metro Park uh, mm -hmm. on October 4th. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a Sunday morning and you all may not know it, but I know we have a flu shot clinic um, scheduled for that day if we are indeed at church. Um, and I wonder if it might be possible for us to walk at a different time um, and still support that effort if that particular date doesn't work and if people here would be interested in that. You can always participate virtually. You don't have to be there on that day. And, um, you know, we used to do an inside walk in February in Ann Arbor through the Five Delts, which was Lou Gehrig's um, fraternity. Um, but all of those young men have since moved on. So there is an option for a virtual walk, or I know 
of course, Kensington is closest for you. Uh, the difficulty we have is, um, yes, we know it's a Sunday, and Saturdays a, a lot of times don't work out for people of other faiths, so it's really finding what works best. And I, I certainly understand your concern when you, when you all attend church, but I would recommend... Um, you know, setting up a virtual walk. If, if some people can come, then they can come, but everybody can or participate virtually if that works for you. Okay. I'd like to go back to the, the getting comfortable. You're absolutely right. You cannot get comfortable. And it's very difficult to explain to someone how to get you comfortable. Oh my goodness, I can't imagine. You know, it's like lift my big toe up and move it or move my thumb away from my fingers. Mm -hmm. right? Because it's smooshing into my fingers now and I can't move my thumb. So being comfortable is just a big challenge. And I think what people don't realize is that, you know, as the disease progresses and your muscles atrophy, you, you, you lose muscle mass and it exposes, you know, a lot more of your bone structure than you usually had. You, people will have, you know, protruding bones on their back and, and, you know, their ankles are smaller and, you know, they're rubbing up against things that they never used to. So that's when pressure, pressure points start to develop. And, you know, it, it is, it's very difficult to work through when you can't move yourself. Now, Judy, um, I, I just want to say thank you um, you know, as a caregiver, just the advice that you've given, the, the foresight in providing things that you knew that we would need at some point has been amazing. Um, the loan closet, I don't know what we would have done without the loan That's closet. Our wheelchair. Yes, yes. Um, the, the, when we got the, the wheelchair, the power wheelchair, mm -hmm. That was a huge quality of life issue for Lisa to be able to move around. And then it gave us the framework for when Lisa got her personalized chair to say, this is what we liked and this is what we didn't like about the chair that we had. We would not have been able to do that without having something in advance. I mean, well, I'm, so glad many that I'm glad that worked out for you. And you're right. When you have never had a power chair before, you don't know what's going to be best for you and what's not. And that's why we have a loan closet, because as I'm sure you know, sometimes power chairs can take eight or nine months to get. Well, yeah. what if you need it right now? You have to, you know, you can't wait eight or nine months. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad ALS of Michigan was able to help you with that. And I know you want it picked up, but you need to let me know when you're, you feel safe having someone come and do that. It's in the garage, so whenever anybody can come, it's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Have you been keeping it plugged in occasionally? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Because <laughs> uh, batteries are pretty expensive, so I appreciate that. So I'm going to be in the office one day this week. I will shoot an email to New Motion, letting them know they need to contact you about picking that up. Can they also pick up the transition chair, the transfer chair? Um, they, I will ask them about that. We usually don't have them pick up other things no. um, because they do it for free for us when they're in the area doing something else. But I'll ask them about that and I'll let you know. If not, you know, I only live 20 minutes from um, Ann Arbor. I can always buzz out and um, if you have it in your garage, I can pick it up. I kind of like to take a ride every once in a while now that we're <laughs> on lockdown so <laughs> that'll work as well <laughs> thank you, so much. you guys have been wonderful oh thank you why well, we're here and it's good to see you ladies from the church <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs>
<laughs> I'll nod my head because I can't wait. Uh, With my grandson, I stick my tongue out, and now he's getting in trouble. He's sticking his tongue out. <laughs> how, how, how old is he now, Lisa? 18 months. Oh. And he's moving in tomorrow. Oh, oh my gosh. It's going to be so fun. Exciting. That's a joyful move, huh? That'll give me something to smile at every day. Absolutely. He'll be pushing all your buttons. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He likes to turn my lights on on the wheelchair. <laughs> Possibly, literally, and figuratively. <laughs> right, right. Lisa, on my last visit, I heard you say that when you were using your power chair, he would sometimes follow behind when he was learning to walk. As he was grabbing the hold of the, the cord on the ventilator. And yeah. <laughs> oh, man. He was trying to keep up with me. My daughter said, <laughs> you know, uh, kids are kids really adjust well to the changes that come not only with ALS but with a lot of diseases. It it just kind of, you know, fits right in because they haven't had an opportunity to make a decision on whether this is normal or not, whatever normal is. But I have a cute little quick story for you. I worked with a family probably ten years ago, and they had a grandson during the time that he was dealing with the disease and they we had sent them a leg lifter and I don't know if any of you have seen a leg lifter but it's it's a um, pretty rigid uh, piece of uh, wire and it has a loop on one end for you to hold and a loop on another end for you to stick your foot in so you can lift your leg well one day the pals and his wife came to the office with their grandson to return the leg lifter, and he was pretending like he was walking an imaginary dog. <laughs> <laughs> so even the simplest little piece of equipment can be turned into something else by a child. <laughs> well, thank you so much. for we, we learned some more information. And we'll be reaching out um, to Lisa for, for some more help. She's a lot of fun to work with. You'll yes, really yes. like her. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting us to do this. I, I, uh, I'm really glad to, to have the opportunity to share the information.